fracture does this, and it breaks up into these fins. This is what has happened to this fracture. Going back to the scale of the crystals, not to the scale of the atoms, this is now a microphoto, maybe this is a few micrometers, showing some little crystals in the rock. And here is the tip of a fracture. And what you see is that the fractures in real rocks, they are not per perfectly smooth. They are actually a little rugged because they often follow the boundaries between the crystals. And around these fractures, there is a zone which is damaged. There is a name for this zone. It is called the damage zone. Very easy to remember. And this is found in rocks, in ceramics, in metals, in many, many materials. So after we actually find, localize the crack, around the crack we find a certain amount of damage. And the reason for that is that if you have a fracture breaking the rock, remember there is this stress field around it, very, very high stress, then the rock kind of breaks in this zone of high fracture, of high stress intensity, and then the fracture continues, and it breaks the rock here, okay? And then the fracture continues, and what you find is that the fracture is basically surrounded by a zone of rock which has been damaged, the damaged zone around the fracture. And here is a beautiful microscopic picture of this showing that here is the tip of a crack and you can see this damage around the crack. Okay, this is where the material is damaged before the crack actually propagates. Okay, so now we have understood how these fractures form in opening mode, what their orientation is with respect to the stress field. But we have until now only talked about one fracture, what happens with one fracture. Now, in real rocks, in real ceramics, in real metals, you rarely have just one fracture. You have many fractures. And these fractures form patterns. And these fracture patterns are all around us. And they tell us a lot about the stress field and also about the way that the stress field has evolved. So this example here is a mud flat somewhere in an arid region where a clay has been deposited very nicely and it has dried out and it has shrunk and because of that it has formed tensile stresses. The stress has become negative and the rock has fractured and it has formed this pattern because the rock is shrinking in every direction. And here is something similar. This is a piece of a ceramic, which is prepared using the Cracolet method. So the ceramist put a, a glaze on the ceramic and cools it down so that the glass glaze actually shrinks a little more than the ceramic, and you find, form all these fractures. Now, one very interesting feature here that allows you to analyze these fractures, is this thing here, which is called a butting, aufeinanderstoßen in German, a butting. So there is one fracture, and the other fracture does like this, a T-junction. Now, you can ask yourself, which one of these fractures is younger? And I think if you think about it, uh, it will be clear that this is the old fracture and this is the young fracture. This fracture was propagating in this direction 
And when it hit the other fracture, it could not pro continue, it could not propagate, because the stresses at its tip were taken away by a little bit of slip along this old interface. And this is something which is used in technology. If you want to make a bulletproof glass, you have to make it layered, because the fracture cannot continue across this interface. <coughs> so abutting, these kind of relationships allow you to, to work out the history of the fracturing. For example, here, it's clear that this fracture formed before that one, and then this one. So this is the oldest, this is the middle, and this is the youngest. Okay. Another thing which is very important is that in layered rocks, in layered rocks, the distance between fractures is related to the thickness of the layer. This is called boudinage. When there is a ductile rock flowing in this direction and trying to extend this rock, and it fractures. <coughs> but the fractures cannot get too close to each other for reasons that will come back in later courses. So thick layers have large distances between fractures and thinner layers, for example, a layer like this, have much closely, more closely spaced fractures. And you can see this very nicely in this rock from, um, from Naxos in Greece where a marble, a very ductile marble has flown and ruptured these amphibolites. And you can see that the distances between the fractures in the thick layer are much larger than the distances between the fractures in the thin layers. And this is a rule which comes back all the time. So, let's look at fracture patterns now. A very famous fracture pattern is that in basalts, where you have these columns, and clearly the reason why this evolves in such a way is that the cooling of the basalts gives you a tensile stress in all directions. The rock, there is not a preferential direction in which the rock is stressed. So, before the whole thing starts, the stress must be a point in this Mohr circle. And then you get a very regular, kind of hexagonal looking pattern of columns in the basalt. But if you have a stress field, a far field stress field, then a pattern like this can turn into a pattern like that. And here, the fractures have formed in this direction very regularly, and you can see by the abutting that these little fractures are the second generation. They are younger. So first, this rock was fractured in a pattern like this, and then it broke up like that. This can happen in a thin layer of clay that you dry on your tabletop, but it can also happen in rock layers which are 20, 30 meters thick. And examples of that are very, very beautifully uh, shown, again, in the Arches National Park. We keep going back to Arches National Park. Maybe you have seen this arch, the famous delicate arch. It comes back in several Western movies. And the reason why this thing has formed is because there were two fractures, and then the rock could be eroded to form this arch. A little bit... Um, less further, less far evolved version of this arch can be seen somewhere else in this national park. Here you have these enormous fins of rocks which stand out in the landscape, and these fins are controlled by fractures going down through the rock layers. And these features, because the layers are very thick, 
are actually quite big, and they are big enough to be seen from space. So you can go to Google Earth, and you can see these fractures from the top. We will put uh, the links to these uh, sites on, on the course website, so please go and check them out. So this is here now a scale of 200 meters, okay, zooming in in Google Earth. And what you see here is the top of a sandstone layer, which was washed clean because the, above it there was a clay layer, and the clay layer is very easy to erode. And these are the fractures. A very, very consistent set of parallel fractures, and you can, using the abatic relationship, you can clearly see that these fractures are second order. They are the younger ones. Okay. So... This is one very important uh, way to analyze fracture patterns. What happens if two fractures get too close to each other? Well, you have seen that around a fracture tip there is a stress field. So one fracture tip has its own stress field, and if another fracture comes with its own stress field, these two stresses will start to feel each other. And the fractures will actually join like this. This is what is seen quite a lot in nature. And then you will see patterns like this. And here is a very nice example. In a granite, there is a fracture here. And it moves towards the other fracture like that. So these are two fractures. And now you can ask yourself, the filling of this fracture is an applite. Okay, so this was formed at 20 or more kilometers depth in the earth. How can I get a tensile stress at a great depth like this? And the reason is, of course, that here I put the effective stress. And if you are at 20 kilometers and the stress is very high, but the pore pressure, the pressure of the melt is the same as the overburden pressure, then the effective stress can be tensile. And this is why you can have these fractures at very great depth in the Earth. Okay, so we have now seen the morphology of fractures. We have seen the basics of why these joints actually form the way they do. And I have already said just a few words about how fluids in the earth can move through fractures. If you open a fracture, the movement of a fluid is much, much easier than it is in a tight rock. So this is all about fluids. And there are a lot of complexities